Welcome everybody to another lecture. Today's unit is Participate in Safe Food Handling Practices and the unit code is SITXFSA002. Today we'll be going through all of the slides so feel free to pause wherever you may need to. We will be pausing between the activities so you guys have time to complete them so feel free to take the time that you need. If you get confused or have any problems anywhere, feel free to come back to any point of this recording and replay and just try and get your head around it. If you have any questions, don't you know hesitate to contact me. My email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au So if you see me you know, don't hesitate to ask me or just shoot me an email if you've got any questions and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. And try and use your trainers as much as you can so, you know, they're uh, well versed in this industry so they'll have a lot of knowledge to help you out with any questions if you have them. Alright, so let's begin. So, follow food safety program 1.1 access and use relevant information from organizational food safety program. So essentially you want to think about whatever organization that you're going into, whether it be a small restaurant, cafe, um, food hall, cafeteria, function venue, if it's got a council or government approved um, food production facility, then you know you're expecting it to have a food safety program so some of the things that you want to know about all right so some of these terms that you may never have heard before some of you may have so we've got contaminant means any biological or chemical agent physical or other substances that may comprise uh, compromise food safety or suitability uh, so essentially it could be anything like hair it could be dirt broken glass, plastic, anything that you don't want it to be there, right? So it could be that you have cooked seafood and then there's raw chicken or beef there, anything like that. Biological agents, including microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses and molds. So, you know, it could be anything like fungi that is not consumable or harmful to people. Um, yeah, something that's... Um, you know, could be airborne and has come into the food, you know, so you want to be aware of where you're getting things, the locations of um, the certain products where they're made, so if something happens in that area, you know, okay, this has come from, let's say, Liverpool, and if Liverpool's had a salmonella outbreak, you know, okay, I need to be aware of the items that I'm using, you can look up um, any recent updates on council websites for that area on what is happening to those affected items and things like that and go from there. Chemical agents include any chemicals, uh, liquid, solid or gas that may contaminate food and make it toxic for consumption. So it could be like bleach if you're using it as a cleaning agent but in our industry we want to use food grade chemicals that are biodegradable and you know if they are consumed it creates less havoc in the human body than compared to those ones that we can't use. Physical matter includes physical objects that may be in food such as string, paper clips and glass. We're also looking at allergies as well. So any allergens such as you know peanut allergies, uh, shellfish, things like that will also affect your customers as well. So you need to be aware of those things when you're handling food, when you're doing cross-contamination you know, you need to know, okay, am I putting peanuts somewhere that it's not supposed to be and we're guaranteeing customers that there are no peanuts? You need to be careful. Use gloves. Use one um, cooking utensil per item. Don't mix and match between. Alright, contamination means the introduction or occurrence of a contaminant in food. So, anything like hair, dirt, plastic, whatever. Potential hazardous food means food that has to be kept at certain temperatures to minimize the growth of any 
uh, pathogenic microorganisms that may be present in the food or to prevent the formation of toxins in the food. So anything that can potentially pose a problem is a potentially, uh, you know, within the food or can go forward as in, you know, seafood does uh, gets a lot worse um, and can create a lot more problems if you let it, um, you know, be in the danger zone and once it's consumed it will be very dangerous to the people who consume it um, compared to let's say vegetables, right? So. Um, whenever we're dealing with seafood we need to be extra careful that we're dealing it within the correct cool temperatures or if it's cooked then above that 60 range okay a hazard analysis and critical control points so a critical control point is anywhere that you feel has a um, certain um, transformative aspect so if it's you're cooking it, right? So it's being changed from one form to the other. If you're changing its place, so if you're storing it from one place to the other, or if you're giving it to somebody from the kitchen to the customer, so it's one place to the other. So anywhere that it's changing position, changing form, changing hands, changing location, changing temperatures, I want you to focus on those things for your critical control points. Okay, so when you're doing a hazard analysis, for food especially, identify any hazards that must be avoided, removed or reduced in your process that's involved. Okay, Identify and monitor the critical control points that are involved that you identify. So if I was going to talk about a beef mince, right? And if I am not the producer of the beef, we need to know that whatever beef, uh, beef is produced in a factory or in the farm and they're butchered, it's done humanely and it's done in a um, the least amount of hazardous material around that be uh, the cow and it's the cleanest as we can get it without it being too harmful to a customer once it's transported it should be checked within the temperature if it's frozen it should be at a certain negative temperature or if it's uh, just in the fridge in a cooling form it should be under a certain positive temperature or even a zero or a negative um, it can't be over five degrees if you're then producing it here you need to make sure when you receive it you're checking your temperatures when you're receiving that item when you're cooking it you're checking your temperatures how long you've stored it you're putting these logs in place, you're writing the dates down, writing the time down, writing the temperature down, things like that. Okay. Procedures in place to put things right if there is a problem with a critical control point. Put checks in place to make sure your plan is working. Record food monitoring activity. So like I said before, food monitoring activity is very important um, because let's say if today I'm working at the job role that you are and tomorrow I feel like I want to quit the job right so you need to know um, if you're gonna replace me what I've done yesterday so then you can carry on from there but if you don't know I'm if I'm not getting paid from the job and I've quit I'm not gonna uh, pick up your call and say yes I did this I did that I don't care I don't know who you are so it's very important for any business to have these processes in place, these logbooks in place. So if you have left, then the following person knows what to do. That who, the, you know, whoever's going to replace you. Okay, so the seven principles of HACCP to conduct a hazard analysis, identify the critical control points, establish critical limits, monitor the critical control points so you'd also want to log them right establish corrective action so if there are issues what you would do in this case so you don't want to come up with a uh, corrective action as it happens you already want to like preempt already guess what situations could be and write down what the list of solutions could be in a list somewhere for somebody to follow verification with the staff that are working with you, managers, anybody that needs to sign off on anything, so it could be an owner, could be a manager, could be the supplier, 
uh, record keeping. Yes, so you want to follow all of those issues down and always be record uh, keeping records of whatever is happening throughout your kitchen. So if you are, you know, if you don't remember anything or if you're being replaced or if somebody else is coming in to know what's happening, you've got a um, day by day or a easily, um, you know, a record so that the next person can create a picture in their minds of what has happened. Okay, and if you need more information, just go to that link. It will have a range of information for you to grow your understanding about these seven factors and principles. Organizational food safety program. A food safety program may cover potential hazards, possible control measures, monitoring of control measures, responding to hazards, program review and record keeping procedures. So activity 1A, why is it important to follow a food safety program? So essentially we want if we have a food safety program it puts us in place right by law we need to follow um, a food safety program and have you know set up procedures for if things go wrong so always first by law we need to have food safety programs established in the business then it's an organizational procedure I might lose my job if I don't um, follow the food safety program so uh, thirdly we need to look after our customers so if we don't have a food safety program in place, we won't be able to know if anything does go wrong where it did go wrong and then we couldn't take any actions accordingly. Secondly, we want to identify any potential hazards or any issues that are existing in the business or in the processes that we have and then we can, once identified, develop solutions for those problems and then create less, less risk for our customers. Number two, what are the key requirements of a food safety program? So there are seven or yes, there are six requirements essentially. Uh, identifying potential hazards, possible control measures, monitoring of control measures, responding to hazards, um, having program reviews and recording, um, you know, whatever's happened and whatever solutions. So any rectifications that you might need. So. You also want to say that there's, you know, spots for who's conducted um, the food safety program and who's followed it, who's observed the, uh, who or supervised the following of this food safety program, who who's conducting the record keeping, things like that. You want to have names and dates and contact information and time exactly as possible, temperatures, things like that. Okay. Number three, locate a copy of your own organization's food safety program. Identify at least three safe work procedures which you are required to undertake in your job role. So in this case, you would be able to um, locate uh, Ecos restaurants if you don't have your own restaurant or cafe that you work at. You could locate the Ecos restaurant um, food safety program and essentially three safe work procedures that I would have to do is follow proper hygiene procedures such as washing my hands thoroughly, um, keeping records of temperatures for equipment, having proper maintenance procedures for my equipment, wearing proper protective equipment uh, for my safety and the safety of others and the protection of food, not uh, cross-contaminating between items, so things like that. There's so many um, procedures that I need to follow in the workplace timing of um, things, how long it's been outside, following the safe, um, you know, four hour, two hour rule of storing foods in the danger zone, things like that, okay? So when you guys have completed those three questions, come back to me and pause the video and we will continue on from there. Okay, 1.2, follow policies and procedures in food safety program. Food safety policies and procedures include cleaning and sanitation, hazards, equipment maintenance, uh, food information, personal considerations, pest control procedures, recording maintenance procedures, and training procedures. Right. So activity 1B, what is the purpose of policies and procedures in your workplace or organization's food safety program? 
So these procedures and procedures are a, could be a step by step process outlined by your company that you have to follow during the food safety program. So if I was to say, okay, I need to check the temperatures of the item uh, of the let's say cool room, I would also need to make sure that I'm uh, checking the um, the maintenance schedule or the cleaning schedule. So then I can identify, okay, why is the cool room so dirty if it is, or why is the cool room not functioning properly? Okay, we didn't, um, you know, get the cool room motor uh, maintained or fixed, or we didn't regularly check the temperatures. What aspects of food handling should policies and procedures cover? So, certain things such as um, you know the 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 food, the maintenance, the record keeping, how you're going to be doing it. Um, you know, it could be food handling, could be personal, you know, protective equipment, what you should be wearing, things like that. They'll cover um, in case of an emergency or any problems that may occur, what to do, things like that. If you describe a food handling procedure that is in place in your organization, explain why this procedure exists. What hazard does this procedure prevent or deal with? Okay, so first of all, I want to, if I was asked this question for Equus Restaurant, um, our food handling procedure that I can think of straight off the top of my head is when we are dealing with eggs, right? That's an easy one. Uh, whenever we're dealing with eggs, we do not crack the egg over um, the utensil that we're going to be using it as let's say if we're cracking it into a bowl or a fry pan we're not going to crack it near or over that item because you can get shells in there you don't know how clean the eggshell is over the top so you can get maybe bird poop or, or chicken poop or any dirt or debris into your egg that which will contaminate the egg so we always make sure to crack it over a unused surface that we're not going to be using to consume and then we pour the cracked egg into the utensil or bowl or whatever we're going to use to cook it separately. So the reason why we have it is to prevent any contamination over the from the shell and also if your egg is rotten you can check. Right? Uh, what hazard does this produce or uh, procedure prevent? So we're trying to prevent contamination from any dirt from the shells. Okay. So if you want, if you have a procedure in your workplace, tell us what what it is, why um, it exists, and what it's trying to prevent. Okay. Essentially. So complete those questions. When you're ready, come back to me, and we can move on to the next one. Okay, follow food safety program 1.3 control food hazards at critical control points. So food hazards, actual or potential hazards, um, you know, if you've maybe if you're working at um, an open cafe outside and you're it's near the beach. So you've got potential for sand to get in, right? But it's not an actual existing hazard that could happen straight away. It's something potential. If there is a windstorm, you could have excess amount of sta sand coming into your food preparation area. But if you're thinking about actual, it could be people not wearing hair nets that work in the preparation area. So you could have loose hair in your food. Then we've got chemicals, insects and vermin. So if you're working at an animal cafe, you've got pets walking around in the service area. Maybe they get their hair um, stuck in their food or they're bringing in their own sorts of bacteria and insects with them. So there's an issue there. If you've got open kind of style kitchen, you've got a lot of, if you're on the bottom floor, you know, you could have rats walking through. Cockroaches a lot easier than compared to having it on the second floor. Microbiological, like bacteria and things like that, um, that could be already existing somewhere, and um, you need you now order that item into your shop, so now it's starting to spread 
from one item to the other in your cool room or something like that. Physical, so it could be, you know, pl broken plastic thing or glass or any, if you're having construction, any dirt or piece of wall or concrete, whatever it might be. Okay, and processes related to where food is vulnerable to contamination. So if it's anywhere such as a unmonitored temperature, you know, room or area or equipment, um, and it doesn't have temperature control, so meaning you can't cool it or you can't heat it, that's where it's going to be most vulnerable and create more bacteria, especially in that danger zone range, which is between above 5 and below 60. Okay, so critical control points receiving. So, like I said, anything where it's, you know, you're getting it or moving it or changing it. So anything that's happening to the item needs to be controlled, that point of access. So receiving, storing, preparing, processing, displaying, serving, packaging, transporting, or disposing. Methods of ensuring food safety. So you want to be packaging items properly as to your organization's procedure and making sure that it's um, clean and hygienic. Protective barriers, so other people's you know, bodily fluids or sneezing or any spit or um, you know, sweat are not getting into the food. Temperature control, so you're using you know, accurate th thermometer temperature probes and uh, so you're making sure everything's in your desired temperature range. Supervision of food display, so if you've got a hot bar or a buffet system, you've got somebody who's uh, regularly checking the food so that the temperatures are uh, up to your standards. Utensil control, so this could be where you know, you've got proper hygiene procedures and cleaning procedures in place and sterilizing them from use from in each individual use or using one-time equipment it could be like plastic disposable spoons forks whatever or when you're in a buffet situation or giving multiple food items that people aren't cross-contaminating with utensils moving it from one place to the other providing separate serving utensils for each dish yeah like I said before you know you don't want to give them one spoon and have eight items so now they're going from the rice to the curry back to the curry or uh, another curry and then into the rice and now the rice is all these curry gravies and each of the gravies might be seafood and meat and they're all mixed together you don't want to have that going okay so give a separate um, utensil serving a utensil for each dish that you place in front of your customers activity 1c part 1 Give examples of food hazards in the following categories. So chemical could be bleach, right? Insects or vermin could be um, such as a rat or a cockroach for less hygienic places. Microbiological could be bacteria, could be fungi, could be <coughs> um, uh, salmonella. Physical, physical could be broken glass, could be um, broken plastic loose hair right? processes related so if we're thinking about temperature control food can go off or not um, following proper temperature control in here as well I would want you to think about allergies as well so if you think about maybe you know not thinking and touching peanuts and then going back into chicken so that people aren't aware that yes they've had um, uh, a connection between peanuts so now the customer will now have an issue because maybe they can't consume peanuts so that could also be a food hazard okay define and give an example of a critical control point so a critical control point is anywhere where it is critical for you to observe um, what is happening with that item so anything that is transformative so if it's being stored uh, somewhere if you're receiving it if you're disposing it or if you're um, cooking it uh, anything like that if you're throwing you know throwing it away what temperatures what time anything you need to ob observe those things what are happening with that item okay give examples of steps which you take to minimize risks at each of the following critical control points um, please omit any steps which are not relevant in your job role okay so if we're displaying items um, 
we need to make sure we're following the four hour two hour rule okay we're following the temperatures and we're not uh, putting it in the danger zone past that four hour rule if it is we're throwing it out serving we're making sure proper hygiene procedures are in place people are wearing the proper foods it's served in proper containers right we're giving them proper utensils packaging we're using hygienic packaging and the right amount we're not overflowing the packaging transporting we're using refrigerated trucks we're timing how long the refrigeration transport has taken uh, we're checking the temperatures disposing we're tightly securing up any rubbish bags we're making sure those areas are locked and not able to be accessed by any vermin uh, or any people so they can't consume those things otherwise you know they might think it's good to consume but then um, they'll fall ill because they're consuming things that are not proper to consume uh, receiving if you're thinking about getting any supply from externally you're checking temperatures you're checking the due dates expiry dates things like that storing you're checking your areas are clean not um, maybe it's not covered with debris and anything that could contaminate the item and it's proper temperatures preparing so whenever you're preparing using gloves um, handling that item individually not d going back and forth between two different um, preparation activities and processing you're cooking them to the right temperature for the right amount of time um, so that there are um, you know the least amount of chances to have any bacteria in place or give raw foods to anybody all right so st finish that write those um, like a line or two for each of them and then come back and pause the video and we can move on to the next one okay activity 1c part 2 what are critical control points in the following scenario? A hotel kitchen takes a weekly delivery of raw chicken, which is packaged in sealed packaging. The chicken in stored, um, is stored until it is needed, when prepared and cooked in a variety of dishes. The, chicken, uh, the dishes are served at a hot service counter in the hotel. Um, the chicken dishes which are not served are then brought back to the kitchen and are either disposed of or they are stored for evening service in some cases the leftover food is used for other dishes then in the following day okay so we need to find control points so hotel take weeks lead okay, so we're looking at the delivery so delivery is one of the points we're looking at temperatures and the times and where it was stored because it was raw we need it to be uh, five degrees or below to be uh, stored in a cool place such as the fridge or if it's raw and frozen then should be in, a, in the negatives packaging we're looking at the packaging so it's not damaged it's another one and um, we're looking at where we are storing it so if we're storing it to defrost we can't have it below the um, you know, if we're not having it above the danger zone, um, you know, five degree temperature, we can't have it outside too long than four hours. If it's in the fridge, then we're allowing it to stay there, covered, whatever it might be, and then prepare. So then we're looking at the cooking, what temperatures it's been cooked at. So it needs to be cooked at above 60 and made sure that it's not raw. Dishes are served, hot service. So we're looking at the service counter where it needs to be above 60 to be stored there. Okay, so brought back to the kitchen. So we need to make sure that the timing is observed when they store it. But for disposal, that wherever it's being disposed of is being correctly disposed of. And if it's an excess amount that is worrying, we need to let a supervisor or manager know what evening service so for evening service um, we will need to check how long the chicken has been out for if it's been out for more than four hours below that um, 60 degree time then we need to dispose of it but if it's followed the right procedure then we don't need to 
So the leftover, we need to make sure that it's followed the 4 hour, 2 hour rule, so we can use it in the next item. Okay, so, yeah, break that, um, that paragraph down, and there's a few there, I would say there's at least 7 points in there, where you need to have critical control points there, okay? So, write descriptions for those 7, wh where you need to uh, control, and then come back to me when you're ready. Alright, so... 1.4. Complete food uh, safety monitoring processes and complete documents as required. Food safety monitoring, bacterial swabs and counts. So, usually, you know, your council would have a bacterial um, bacteria counter, they swab the area and then see how much bacteria you have in that area. So, you, if you're getting to that point, it's kind of risky as in, you know, they, they're essentially doing that because you look dirty. So, they need to put it on paper, um, you know, to justify shutting you down, essentially. Uh, checking and recording that food is stored in appropriate time frame. So, you know, you're recording these. You're making sure that they're not in danger zone temperatures. You're making sure that whatever you're putting it in is the correct storage area. Chemical tests. So these can, you know, show if it's gone acidic or if it's too basic or neutral. Things like that. Um, monitoring and re recording food temperatures. Very important. That monitoring and recording temperatures of cold and hot storage equipment. Visual examination of food for quality review. So. You know, walking through, looking at your cool rooms, looking at your items, has your veggie leaves wilted, spinach is good, looking fresh, or it's all shrunken and now starting to break up and form liquid at the bottom of the bag. You know, you're doing those temperature checks, writing in your logbook. Uh, monitoring checks, this will require you to be familiar with the types of food you are responsible for monitoring, how often you should conduct the monitoring, what monitoring procedures you should follow, what monitoring equipment you need to use, what documentation you need to complete, things like that, very important. So, <coughs> <coughs> essentially you're looking at your policies and procedures and what your job role consists of, and then you're completing all those documentation accordingly. If, you ha if your job role is getting bigger, your business is getting bigger, maybe you need to, you know, section away a bit more time to complete those items you can't just neglect it because you say oh I got busier so I didn't do it it's not a if you're busier you're making more money you need to hire more people so everything is still in routine activity 1d how do you monitor the safety of the following types of food and how frequently do you do this um, you may contextualize your answer to your own job role fresh versus frozen meat please omit any that do not apply. So, if we're talking about cheese, we're monitoring the cheese depending on where it's placed. You know, we want to time out how long because it's dairy. If it's not consumable dairy uh, to where it's been dry aged and it's, uh, it has low moisture count, we need to put it in the fridge because if it's got a high moist count, uh, moisture count, it will produce a lot of bacteria. Bananas. We would store it outside because it's got a protective coat over the top, um, but we would make sure that it's um, out of harm's way, no animals or vermin can get to it, and things like that. Frozen vegetables, um, we're thinking about where we're storing it, because once we defrost it, it will start losing its liquids internally, and then it will transform from one form to the other, because now essentially you've done a cold cook on it because it's lost all of its moisture or defrost um, flour we're looking at storage containers needs to be sealed we're dating the containers if we're putting it there um, it could because it, it could, could go stale making sure the airtight containers are in place eggs we're making sure that we're putting it in a cold storage area or in the fridge the dates that we've received them, potatoes, we're making sure that there's no dirt on them, not any debris, any, anim you know, insects or animals, meat, 
we're looking at okay raw or cooked if it's cooked we're looking at the temperatures and duration so you might not want to store anything for more than three to four days in the fridge but in the freezer you might go for two weeks and then dispose of that item um, you could go longer it just depends on what time it is what quality of item you want to provide to your customers seafood we're looking at um, again raw or cooked the positioning um, because it can produce liquid like the raw meats can putting it over other foods will you know cross contaminate uh, if you're cooking it what duration if you're storing it outside what duration if you're not following the four hour two hour rule if you're keeping it in the danger zone okay so talk about all those um, mention the uh, things that I've mentioned to you include any ideas that you may have let's go on to the next one so number two what is the purpose of documenting food monitoring processes firstly it most likely will be a, a policy that is um, within your job role and within your company so if you don't do it you might not have a job secondly you want to make sure that all your customers can have the utmost confidence in you and your processes that you conduct so that you are you know you can tell we are the cleanest and we provide the freshest items that are possible list all food monitoring documents that you use in your job role so <coughs> in our job role we use um, you know it would be um, log books food safety programs um, maintenance logs, cleaning logs, what else? Uh, manufacturing instructions. Yeah, that's it, right? Recipes, and if they're being followed, temperature logs, um, time logs for buffets and things like that, how long food's been out. Okay, anything that can come to your mind that you think you'd use at your job role that I have not mentioned, you can include as well. Alright, so write down all your answers there for that question. Come back to me when you're ready, unpause the video, and we can move on to the next one. Okay, 1.5. Identify and report non-conforming practices. Implementing food safety practices. Uh, staff can sometimes forget the procedures or haven't been properly trained in them. Staff can sometimes choose not to follow the procedures. Equipment and resources sometimes don't allow procedures to be implemented fully or correctly. Reporting non-conformance, you should ensure you know how to submit a report, when to submit a report, the correct report format, what must be included in a report and to whom to submit a report to. So activity 1E, why is it important to identify a report and report non-conforming practices? Essentially, if we don't identify these issues, we are going to be putting our customer and our business in a risk. So we want to eliminate that risk. We want to follow proper procedures. We want to identify if anybody is not doing it, who is not doing it, and how we're going to stop this from happening, what actions we've taken for it to not happen in the future. So that our customers, our workers, and our business can be protected. Okay. Number two. Discuss examples of non-conforming practices that you have observed. What did you do about it? If you saw similar non-conformances in the future, what would you do about it? Okay, so for my personal example, uh, I have once seen um, a worker drop an item on the floor and then pick it up and then put it back on the plate and serve it to the customer. So what did I do? I told them, look, this is not going to be uh, served to the customer. We need to s stop this item from going outside. We need to dispose of it correctly. And then we need to produce another one as soon as possible and then send it out. In the meantime, we need to go and apologize to the customer. And in the future, for this not to happen, we have written a report about the staff. And as it is their first time, we did not punish them in any way but we have warned them that if it happens in the future there will be uh, procedures that are put in place to take action against them if it happens again all right simple as that 
How would you respond to each of the following food hazards? When taking delivery, you discover the seal on the package of the cooked ham is spilt. Okay, uh, is split. So, I need to know, first of all, if I don't want to accept it, I can say, look, this looks damaged. I'm not going to accept it. So if you're going to be strict, be strict and say, I don't want to accept it. But if you are going to, you need to check the item thoroughly, check the temperatures, check inside the bag. Um, if you have um, bacterial swabs, check the amount of bacteria that is on the item and if it's a acceptable amount or not. Okay, after you do those, then sign the record that you've taken the delivery. For windows are open, the insects are coming into the food preparation area. We need to first of all close the windows, seal off the area, and then call in pest control to rectify this issue of pests, do a thorough cleaning afterwards, and then start food preparation. Cooked food has been placed on the shelf below raw chicken in the fridge. First of all, we need to check the raw chicken. Is it producing any liquids, Okay, any juices? If it is, then we need to check um, in the raw, in the cooked food, has it been in a box? Is it open? If it's been open, how long has it been open? Does it have any liquids? Okay. Um, if we see any signs of liquid or damage, we need to dispose of that cooked item. Okay. If it's a large amount, we need to let our supervisor or manager know. Right. A light bulb fell from the light fitting overhead and smashed into food preparation area. So first of all, we need to stop work. We need to dispose of the light bulb and any shattered glass. We need to make sure that we quarantine off the area where the shattered glass took place and has fallen. And then whatever it uh, mixed in with, we need to dispose of as we don't want it to go into the customer's mouth or body. Right? Okay, so answer those questions accordingly. When you're done, come back to me and we can move on to the next one. 1.6. Take corrective actions within scope of job responsibility for incidents where food hazards are not controlled. Identifying food hazards. So you can do that by using customer complaints, existence of pests and vermin, food not under control, uh, temperature control, food poisoning, misuse of single-use items, spoiled or contaminated food, stocks or uh, out-of-date food stuff, unclean equipment scope of own responsibility. Depending on the scope of your own responsibility, corrective actions may involve reporting issues to more senior staff members, sanitizing areas and or equipment, implementing pest control measures, reviewing control measures, throwing out unsafe food items. Activity 1F. What type of incidents indicate that food hazard has not been controlled correctly? So could be the temperature, the item is too hot, could be, vi uh, you know, visually there's fungus on it, things like that, right? Um, could be that there are juices on the item which don't um, belong there. So what is the, you know, ultimate conclusion that it's external, it's been contaminated, right? And... Now, let's move on to the next one. Describe what action would you take in your role if a customer complained about a dish being off. So off, the term off means that it is expired or doesn't seem right or smells or tastes wrong, right? So in this case, you would need to apologize to the customer straight away. You need to then take that into the kitchen show the person, the chef or the cook who consumed it, oh sorry, created it, and then you would then um, confirm that it's not to their liking and you will need to take a corrective measure, create a new dish and serve it to them or give them a refund or apologize, give them a any sort of discount and then see what else they would like from the menu if not that same thing. You found dry goods in the storeroom, which were over six months out of date. So first of all, we need to check um, if it's out of date, then most likely the manufacturer doesn't um, recommend using it further. But if it's dry goods that are still impactful and can be used, 
and maybe it's only out of its optimal quality um, you can try and use it somehow but you need to do your checks beforehand you need to consume it you need to put it under a probe and see can it be consumed if it's can't we're disposing of it and then we are creating a report and letting the proper people know okay food preparation area was dirty so first of all we would need to identify who was responsible for cleaning that area then include them in a discussion about why it wasn't cleaned properly and then take measures to correctively clean the area okay food was visibly contaminated with vermin feces so first of all we need to identify um, if we have any open or accessible areas then we need to make sure okay um, what type of vermin could it be and call the um, you know pest control accordingly if it's a rat or dogs or whatever it might be um, yeah call them accordingly and then conduct a press control clean the area thoroughly and then dispose of um, any leftover items and then move forward with the um, new food preparation once all of that is done okay so complete that come back when you're ready and we can move on to the next one 2.1 select food storage conditions for specific food types so food types key food types include dairy dried goods eggs frozen goods fruit and vegetables meat and fish so dairy fridge um, dry goods um, room temperature less humid or no humidity at all eggs cool or fridge cool area or fridge uh, frozen goods freezer obviously you'd preferably want it between negative 15 and 18 degrees fruit and vegetables either in a crisper or between the 6 and uh, 3 degree range right uh, meat and fish so depending on if it's cooked or you want it frozen you could go frozen you could say between negative 10 and negative 18 if you're saying cooked and in the fridge or served hot you could say above 60 degrees in a hot bar storage conditions for specific food types when storing food you must ensure that food is protected from contamination and stored in sanitary conditions. Food is stored under correct environmental conditions. Potentially hazardous food is stored at correct temperature. 2a. Where and how would you store each of the following types? So dairy, fridge, dry goods, uh, dry room temperature area, eggs, fridge, frozen goods, freezer, fruit and vegetables, crisper or fridge, or um, you know you could still say room temperature but that would help it wilt and dry out meat and fish depending on cooked or frozen could be in a hot bar could, uh, could be in the fridge could be in the freezer depending on how you want to store it why is it important to select the correct storage conditions for the food being stored so we want it to be served at the optimal condition and quality so if we do not store it in proper correct areas and temperatures our food will not last long we will be producing a lot more waste and our customers will be at risk ultimately forcing our business to shut down which we do not want okay so give me some of your ideas and those questions once you are done come back and we can move on to the next one 2.2 store food in environmental conditions that protect against contamination and maximize freshness quality and appearance refrigerators foods with uh, a use by date foods that state keep refrigerated on the label foods that state once open keep refrigerated on the label cook foods that will not be served immediately ready to eat foods such as salads and desserts freezers frozen foods should be transferred to freezers straight after delivery the temperature of the freezer should not rise above 18 degrees uh, negative 18 degrees all food should be wrapped do not overcrowd use old stock before new and check date codes D 
defrost and clean freezers regularly. Dry stores. Store dry goods above floor level. Ensure that food is date coated and rotated. Store food in a tidy fashion. Keep food covered at all times. Throw away a swollen packs or badly dented cans. Check tops on bottles and jars to ensure they are secure and sealed are unbroken. Fruit and vegetables should be kept in a cool room and stored off the floor away from ready to eat food. Activity 2B. Which conditions or which foodstuffs would you store in each of the storage conditions? So refrigerator, you could say um, you're storing things that need to be such as um, things that are cooked but will not be served immediately so, or dairy or things like that so it could be milk could be eggs okay freezers we're looking at things that we don't want to serve immediately that are raw or that we have cooked but we don't want to serve immediately or any preparation items could be meat could be fish could be sauteed onions could be pasta sauce okay dry stores could be uh, most likely dry um, spices, flowers, your could be you know temperature, you know room temperature, dried fruits, anything like that. Right. Two point three. Store food at controlled temperatures and ensure that frozen items remain frozen during storage. So we're talking about in this case whatever needs to be stored. Okay is in the temperatures that you desire and you're monitoring them regularly okay so temperature control food should be kept either at five degrees or below or at 60 or above so frozen foods should be kept below negative 18 degrees monitoring temperature the temperature of food must be monitored using a thermometer that is accurate to negative or positive one degree Celsius. The thermometer may need to be inserted into food products to ensure that they are correct temperatures internally and not just on the surface. Thermometers must be sanitized between uses. Activity 2C. What are the key principles of temperature control in relation to food safety? So key, we're making sure that if it's being stored in the cold storage, we are storing it um, below 5. If it's being stored in the hot storage, we're storing above 60. If it's being stored in the freezer, we're storing it below negative 18. Okay, so 3. So you're looking at hot, cool, and um, free, frozen. Uh, and the other one as well if you're keeping at room temperature I would say room temperature is about let's say 18 to 20 degrees okay it just depends on how much humidity there is in that place if you're sweating that means that item is also going to be producing or there is also um, a lot of moisture in, the, in that room what are some of the requirements of keeping frozen foods frozen so we're making sure that we're not overcrowding the area in the freezer. We're making sure we're regularly using the old uh, items that are in there and not the new ones. We're making sure that the freezer is below 18 degrees Celsius, negative 18 degrees Celsius. Um, and they're wrapped and covered correctly so it doesn't freeze or burn as quickly as other items would be if they're left open. Things like that. Okay. So complete those questions, come back to me when you're ready, and we can move on to the next one. Use cooling and heating processes that support microbiological safety of food. For our two-hour rule, studies show potentially hazardous food can be safely held out of temperature control for short periods of time without significantly increasing the risk of food poisoning. The time for which food can be safely held between 5 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius is commonly referred to as the 4 hour 2 hour rule. So applying the 4 hour 2 hour rule, the, the food is in the danger zone between 5 degrees to 60 degrees. 
So between the first two hours, you want to be using that immediately um, or refrigerate the item below five degrees. In the next two hours to four hours, you want to use the item or if you cannot use the item within those two hours, you need to either dispose of that item or cook it or process it so the process starts again. And after those four hours, if you haven't transformed it from raw to cooked or you haven't changed it in somehow, you want to throw away the item. Now this doesn't always apply to everything, like it won't apply to vegetables, alright? You're essentially looking at uh, meats, you're looking at any processed foods that you're doing, like marinating, you know? If it's a um, sweet item, if it's got preservatives, it might not apply. But in general, you want to use this rule of thumb. Okay. Uh, four hour, two hour rule, like the cycle said there. Yeah, after the first two hours, the food must be either used up in the two hours or thrown out. It cannot be returned to refrigeration. Uh, within the first two hours, green zone, there are three options for the food. It can be used immediately, returned to the fridge, or below five degrees, or reheated above 60 but you must keep track of this evidence of correct application for the 4 hour 2 hour rule to be applied correctly it must be ensured that food standards code requirements are followed at all times including during the receiver um, uh, storage and uh, preparation of the food products cold foods are not displayed in direct sunlight or temperatures above 25 degrees. There is a documented system in place for monitoring how long foods have been in the danger zone, ensuring food is properly identified and ensuring that food is disposed of after four hours. Methods of cooling and chilling food. So you could have blast chilling, dividing food into smaller portions so that it could cool quicker, placing pans of the hot food in cold water, Stirring liquid foods to cool more evenly. Placing food in a cold storage area. Heating food. Food that is reheated must be heated to 75 degrees Celsius in the center unless a safe alternative is possible. If intending to reheat food to be served for a continuous period, then the reheating process uh, should be up to 75 degrees Celsius should take a maximum of two hours in order to prevent the bacteria growing food must not be reheated more than once so what is a four hour two hour rule so in this case the first two hours we can use it if it's in the danger zone only if uh, within those two hours then you need to store it back into an item uh, into sorry into a fridge and keep it there below five and if you're going to bring it out again uh, you essentially need to um, monitor it for over the next two hours if you're not going to change the process and cook it or if you're not going to reheat it or if you're not using it and it's you know left over you need to dispose of it after those second two hour intervals that you've had it if it's been out for four hours and you haven't changed it or cooked it you need to dispose of it what methods can you use to cool food? You can put it in a blast chiller, you can put it in smaller containers, you can put it on a tray with liquid uh, over underneath the container and allow the liquid to absorb the heat, but um, you know alleviate any contact from the exact item. What guidelines should you follow when reheating? Uh, you don't want to heat food more than once. You want to be able to heat the center of the item over 75 degrees. And if you're going to be keeping it more than two hours, you want to make sure you're putting it in a place where it can control the temperature. So like a bain-marie. And it can be kept at 75 degrees Celsius. Alright, complete that question. When you're done, come back to me and we can move on to the next one. 3.2. Monitoring food temperature during preparation using required temperature measuring device to achieve microbiological safety. So temperature probes. Food temperature must be tested 
at the center of the food item using a temperature probe. The temperature probe must be accurate to um, you know, plus minus one degree Celsius. Certain equipment will have a thermometer installed, although a probe may also be needed to be used. So some uh, fridges, you know, you'll have a temperature thermostat that will show you what the item the temperature is. Some fryers will say what the temperatures are. Uh, you know, there's rice cookers that will say what ovens, all those things. But you want to be using the correct thermometer and probes. So if it's a hot thermometer, you need to use the correct um, rated thermometer. Otherwise, you'll start melting on your food. If it's a cold thermometer, obviously not an issue. But if it's rated for heat, it might not move when it's cold. So if it's mercury, you don't want to be putting that near any foods, you know, to make sure you're aware. Using the right items, you're sanitizing between you're using them. Using a temperature probe, make sure the temperature probe is clean and dry. Measure different parts of the food as the surface reading may not be accurate. Clean and sanitize the probe between uses. Wait for the thermometer to return to temperature between measurements. Measure the temperature of packaged chilled foods by placing the length of the thermometer between two packages. Thermo uh, thermometer cal uh, calibration. You need to recalibrate food thermometers after an extreme temperature change or it's dropped. Ideally, you should check thermometer temperature calibration once a day with an actual calibration by the manufacturer. Use the ice point method or cold foods and boiling point method for hot foods. So what I like to do is the, it's the easiest one. Everybody's got water, everybody's got a stove. Put the water on the stove. We all know water boils at 100 degrees. Pop the water on there um, and check your thermometer. If it says 70 and the water is boiling, you know that thermometer isn't working. So now you need to readjust and make sure that you put it around 100 when it's boiling. Um, if it says 98, 99, that's okay. Not a problem. Your thermometer is not too much off. But if it says 70, you need to recalibrate and set the temperature ranges properly. Alright. Ice point method. Fill a plastic or metal container which, uh, with chipped crushed ice Add clean water to the depth of at least 10 centimeters, so the mix is 50-50. Ice to water. Stir the ice in water, then wait a minimum of two minutes. Place the stem of the dial thermometer or the probe of the electronic thermometer in the ice slurry. Wait two minutes until the indicator stops changing. While the thermometer is in the ice, in the ice water, adjust the thermometer to zero degrees Celsius, if necessary by following the manufacturer's instructions. Thermometers are usually adjusted with zero screw. Boiling point method. Heat a pot of water until it's boiled and it's achieved. Place a stem of the dial thermometer probe in the, electro, uh, in the electronic thermometer in the boiling water for at least one minute. Read the temperature on the thermometer without removing it from the boiling water. While thermometer is boiling water, adjust the temperature to 100 degrees Fahrenheit if necessary. By following the manufacturer's instructions, thermometers are usually adjusted with a zero screw. So 3B. What temperature measuring devices can be used when monitoring temperature when preparing food? So we're thinking about uh, some uh, equipment will already have uh, a temperature gauge or thermostat but those might not be accurate so you use a temperature probe or a thermometer probe so we need to use the appropriate one based on their uses so if we're using a hot food thermometer it needs to be able to withstand high temperatures if we're using cold food thermometer we need to use something that can work in colder or frozen temperatures if we're using anything based on mercury we need to keep that out of food places so we don't want that to contaminate and break and contaminate our food write the correct procedure for using a temperature probe so we want to be cleaning it we want to make sure it's dry we want to make sure it doesn't have any remnants from the previous item 
we want to make sure that it's being calibrated every day we want to make sure it's accurate to as much um, of a one degree um, you know positive or negative floor point we're also making sure that after we use it we're um, placing it in a clean area and able to be used again without being you know worried about does it have a battery or things like that we're maintaining it properly and using it to its optimal conditions written by the manufacturers instructions describe how to calibrate a temperature probe so if we're using the boiling water method we would put a uh, uh, put water into a pot and then we'd wait for it to boil once it reaches a boiling point we keep the thermometer in there for one minute and if it's not coming up to 100 degrees we would set it to 100 over the end with a zeroing screw okay so write those down in those questions come back to me when you're ready and we can move on to the next one 3.3 Ensure safety of food prepared, served and sold to customers. So ensure food safety, packaging control, protective barriers, temperature control, supervision of food displays, utensil control providing separate serving utensils for each dish. Packaging control, protective barriers, temperature control, supervision of food displays, utensil control. High risk groups, so people you want to take the most care with, children or babies, pregnant women, aged people or like elderly people, people with immune deficiencies or allergies or any unwell people with any illness. Allergen management, customers may present um, themselves with food allergies, food intolerances or uh, celiac disease, no problem. Key food allergies, um, or at least things that we use in our area, so sesame, oil, any wheat, tree nuts, milk, peanuts, fish, egg, any crustacean like shellfish, crab, any soy like sauce or bean, any fermented things, uh, could be ch chilies, you know, you just need to ask the customer before you serve them. The spread of allergens. This can occur, for example, if the allergen is present in the raw materials, if processing acids are used, through cross-contamination with other products and or instruments, improper cleaning and sanitation of surfaces and instruments. Knowing your ingredients. Only accept correctly labeled foods. Check all ingredients even in sauces, spices, garnishes, oils, dressings, etc. for allergens. Avoid ingredient substitution. Be familiar with all ingredients as some may be derived from one or more of the food allergens which may not be obvious from their name. Avoid cross-contamination. Always double check the ingredients with the chef. Handle food safely. Start fresh for meals that must be allergen free. Clean and sanitize work surfaces, utensils and other food contact items between foods. Even very small amounts can be harmful. Avoid cross-contamination. Store food safely. Have a dedicated area for preparing allergen-free meals. Be aware that food that is safe for one person with a food allergy may be unsafe for another person with a different food allergy. Whenever possible, prepare foods for people with food allergy first. Have some way of identifying the meal for the person with the food allergy. Avoid cross-contamination. Always take the meal to the customer with the food allergy separately, not whilst carrying other meals. Check the allergen-free meal is given to the person with the food allergy. List to your customers. Take, uh, listen to your customers. Take customer requests about allergens seriously. Listen carefully. Give customers accurate information about the content of meals when they ask. Have a specific protocol to follow if a customer says they have a food allergy. Listen to your customers. Place the name, uh, place the known allergens next to the menu items if possible. Include a note on all menus 
asking customers to always disclose their food allergy when ordering the menu item. Educate your staff. Ensure your food safety supervisor's training is up to date. Recertification now includes allergen management as required unit of competency. Train and test all staff regularly in food safety, hygiene and allergen awareness. To teach staff of their obligations to declare certain allergens. Display the usual suspects uh, poster in your kitchen. So this could be shellfish, uh, this could be um, nuts or soy or anything like that. Egg risks, so salmonella. The most at risk groups for salmonella are infants, the elderly, pregnant women, people with reduced immunity. Think about raw eggs. Examples of food containing raw eggs include mayonnaise, aioli, salad dressings, hollandaise sauces, eggnog, health shakes with added raw egg, chocolate mousse, tiramisu, and many other desserts. To prevent or reduce the risk of spreading salmonella through raw egg products, your organization can opt for commercially produced raw egg products rather than making these products from scratch. Using pasteurized egg products instead of actual raw eggs wherever possible can also reduce the risk of salmonella. Safe practices. Never buy or use cracked, damaged or dirty eggs. Always store eggs in the fridge in their own cartons and packaging. When storing and handling eggs, take the same precautions as you would when handling and preparing raw chicken, meat, seafood or dairy products. Cook eggs and foods containing eggs until they are hot all the way through. Use pasteurized egg products in foods that will not be cooked or will only be lightly cooked. Alternatively, change to recipes that do not require raw eggs as an ingredient. Include egg safety messages in food hygiene training for staff. So activity 3C. What controls should you follow to ensure the safety of food prepared, served and sold to customers? So we're making sure whenever we're serving these items, we're noting down the temperatures that we're, you know, at least mentally, that they should be served at the appropriate temperatures. We're using proper hy- hygiene procedures. We're, um, you know, if we're giving star uh, any staff food to serve to a customer that with an allergy we'd give only that item separate first so the person with that allergy can be served first we're also putting in um, the duration of how long the item was outside for so if it's out of that four hour period we wouldn't serve it to a customer things like that describe how you would ensure the safety of the following items customer operated hot drinks dispenser so in this case we would want it as safe as possible so it would need a barrier of some sort so people do not get burnt on the hot equipment we would also need the buttons to be um, you know uh, big enough to where they do not touch other functions of the machine and as simple enough so if they do operate it it's a maximum one to two step place with instructions so that they can follow it step by step pre-packaged sandwiches we would put the uh, time it was created the date it was created what time we think it should be consumed by Um, we should put any instructions that may be required the items that are inside the sandwich we should put a list of the ingredients we should be um, recommending the portion size self-service counter we should have sneeze guards we should have the proper utensils and each item has an um, individual utensil we should be monitoring the temperatures of that bar we sh- if it's a cold bar we should be putting it under 5 if it's a hot bar we should be putting it on uh, over 60 
how can you ensure the safety of food served to customers from high-risk groups? So essentially, we first, for any group, it doesn't matter if it's high-risk or not, we need to ask if they have allergies. Then, once that is clear, we need to then make it clear to them that we do have some high-risk items on the menu. If they would still like to take the chance, we can try and use alternatives instead of maybe using raw eggs or maybe um, staying away from allergies we would try and make those items without using those exact items that are um, posing a risk to the customer in a separate area and then serve that customer first and then move on to the other accompanying members of that table and serve them after the person with the allergy and not before so they know that their food is allergen free and risk free um, and main thing is if we are going to serve infants or elderly people or pregnant people that we try and not serve those high risk items in the first place to them okay so complete that part and come back to me when you're ready so activity 3c part 2 Identify two things you must check for each section of the allergy um, aware checklist. Um, these check sections are know your ingredients, avoid cross contamination, listen to your customers, educate your staff. So, um, knowing your ingredients, know uh, that um, you know what is in the item itself. Secondly, you know. Uh, does it have a alternative or is it uh, made out of something that ca could cause an allergy and it's just named differently so to know the alternative names for those items to avoid cross-contamination you want to be following proper food hygiene procedures such as wearing gloves between um, food preparation processes and not using the same utensils or the same gloves between one process to the next you also want to be noting down um, what foods were done when, the times, what were being used in those uh, processes and how they were being handled and when they were created, when they were stored, things like that. Listening to your customers, being respectful, trying to understand what their issues are. If we don't understand, talking to somebody who can um, elaborate on the issues. Also, training the staff. If we're um, not training the staff, they won't be able to understand what uh, the actual customer is wanting and their problems are and then put them in a risk potentially. And then we need to make sure that they have enough education on the allergies and then they're, uh, every you know three to five years they're redoing their um, you know knowledge on the uh, hygiene and allergens section and always upskilling themselves. Identify three things you can do to avoid risks associated with handling and serving eggs. So when we're trying to avoid or serve eggs we need to make sure that we can um, first of all if we can use an alternative um, try and use an alternative to raw eggs. Secondly maybe we try and use commercially produced items instead of making items with raw eggs um, at our venue and pre purchase pre-made items that are commercially produced and guarantee that the risk of uh, raw eggs are low. Thirdly we could also do things such as um, you know pasteurizing the eggs before use so we can lower the risk of giving um, you know any allergies or uh, any poisons for people um, you know with eggs in that situation right so we try and avoid poisoning people with raw eggs at any st any, at any position <laughs> alright so complete that once you're done come back to me and we'll move on to the next one alright provide safe single use items store and display and provide single use items so they are protected from damage and contamination Follow instructions for items intended for single use. Single use items. Disposable items such as cutlery, crockery, so you could have forks, forks, um, knives uh, in a 
sealed up plastic wrap, face wipes and serviettes, individually packaged items such as beverages, uh, condiments, jams and spreads. So you know you're thinking about what am I serving, are they sealed, can anything externally get into that item. We want to make sure all single use items that we serve are sealed and that they're in the optimal condition when we give it to them and they're not expired if it's a condiment or a beverage. Ensuring safety of single use items. Single use items should be stored in clean dry conditions away from potential contaminants for example. Care should be taken to prevent the seals on individually packaged items from being broken. Single use items must be disposed of after use or after they have been in contact with food or handled by customers. Activity 4A. Which single use items are used in your organization? What are the instructions for use? So in our organization at Equish, we use cutlery such as forks, spoons and um, knives which are single use. Um, we give away with the takeaway and they're always packaged, pre-packaged from the factory in a sealed plastic um, um, packaging so we know that it's safe. Also when we um, give them serviettes they're all packaged in a um, plastic packaging so it's not contaminated with anything else in the bag. Which general guidelines should you follow when handling single-use items? So, first of all, the name suggests single-use. So, if it's you being used, touched by other people, or has been near food, or being used around food, we do not have it um, or allow people to use it again, and we dispose of it correctly as soon as possible. Okay. So finish that question, come back to me when you're ready and we can move on to the next one. 5.1. Clean and sanitize equipment surfaces and utensils. Food hygiene and sanitize workspaces. The food handling area must be free from dirt, food waste, grease and pest waste. Cleaning. The cleaning process involves pre-scraping the utensils or surface to remove most of the food residue. Using warm water uh, detergent and agitation to remove food residue and rinsing the detergent and food residue away. Sanitation guidelines. Step 1. Preparation. Remove loose dirt and food particles. Rinse with warm water. Step 2. Cleaning. Wash with hot water between 50 and 60 degrees and detergent. Rinse with clean water. Sanitization guidelines for step 3. Sanitizing bacteria killing bacteria treat with very hot clean water 77 degrees for at least 2 minutes or apply sanitizer as directed on the label. Air drying. Leave benches, counters and equipment to air dry. The most hygienic way to dry equipment is in a draining rack. Cleaning and sanitizing a temperature probe. Wash the probe with a warm water and detergent to remove any grease and food particles. Sanitize the probe using alcoholic wipes or very hot water. Rinse the sanitizer away if necessary. Allow the probe to air dry or thoroughly dry it with a disposable towel. Activity 5A. What guidelines do you follow to clean the following equipment, surfaces and utensils? Dirt, food waste, grease and pest waste. So with dirt, you essentially want to sweep without creating any, um, you know, mini dust storms in your place. You want you want to be mopping with um, detergent in your hot mop, and then sanitizing if needed on the floor or any benches. Food waste we want to be disposing of in food grade uh, disposable bags that we tightly seal and dispose of in the appropriate bins and then seal off those bins until collected by a collection company. In grease we remove using hot water and detergent when 
we are disposing of any grease in large amounts we put in a sealed container and sort away for collection by a disposable company. Pest waste. If we do have large amounts of pest waste, we need to call in a pest control company and then clean the area, sanitize the area. Once it's up to scratch and to a desired level, we will reopen that area for use. But until then, it will be sealed off until um, we are 100% sure that there is no more pests in that area and then all the pest waste will be disposed of correctly either in our sealed bags in the proper area or be given to the pest control person. How would you clean and sanitize the following? The chopping board used to prepare raw poultry so we wouldn't mix it with anything else we wouldn't put any other items on there other than poultry. Once we're done with it we would wash it um, with detergent and then take anything off that's on the board with agitation, wash it under hot water. If we need to, we would air dry it. If we're still unsure that it's been sanitized, we would use some sanitizer that's biodegradable and food safe, or we would uh, put it in water that's above 77 to 80 degrees so that it is sanitized and then air dried. Metal spoons used for stirring and serving hot dishes. So if it's got grease or oils on it, we would use detergent and hot water. Wash it off, let it air dry. Knives used for a variety of purposes. So we would first wash it with detergent and hot water and then let it air dry. Or we would wipe it and then air dry because we don't want any rusting on those knives. Even though we might think that it's stainless steel, we still don't want any rusting. So we wipe it and let it dry and then put it away. Food preparation surfaces. So first we would want to uh, thoroughly clean the area of any dirt, any grime with hot water and soap. Then we would sanitize the bench. After being sanitized and we're happy, we would let it air dry and then go for reusing the surface for food preparation. Number three, describe the steps involved in cleaning a temperature probe. So first of all, we could use alcohol um, swabs or wipes to clean the probe or under hot water above 80 degrees. Once it's washed with the temperature or uh, sorry with the detergent and hot water or the alcohol swab we want it to air dry. We don't want to put any covers back on it or store it straight away. We want it to dry. We could use a paper towel that is um, one time use. Make sure it's dry and then put it in a place where it's um, easily found and not um, you know can can be contaminated for the next item all right so complete that come back to me when you're ready write the if you've got any ideas of your own include those in your answers and then we can continue on to the next one so unpause the video when you're ready and we can move on 5.2. Use appropriate containers and prevent accumulation of garbage and recycled matter. Garbage can consist of waste from food preparation processes, from food that has not been served, from food that has been served to customers that has become contaminated or suspected of being contaminated. Waste management procedures, separate uh, lined or unlined containers for different types of waste. Lids and labels on waste and recycling containers. Waste containers stored away from food and food preparation areas. Frequently emptying all of waste containers. Frequent cleaning and sanitizing of waste containers, etc. Suitable garbage containers. Be adequate to contain the amount and type of waste being thrown away. Bins should not overflow. Bins should not leak. Be able to close completely, prevent overflow, prevent pests from infiltrating garbage. Be easily cleaned and sanitized. Activity 5B. Why is it important to manage garbage and recycled matter? How do you manage the following types of waste in your workplace? Vegetable peelings, waste from raw meat, fish and poultry, packaging materials, food waste from customers, plates, eggshells. So when we're talking about managing garbage and recycled material we need to take on the responsibility um, you know we need to be ethical in our disposing, uh, disposing procedures so 
we don't want to be disposing cardboard and aluminium things that can be recycled so we want to have labeled bins for cardboard we want to have labeled bins for metals that we're going to be able to recycle we want to have a separate plastics bin and we want to have a waste bin if we can um, contribute anything to uh, composting from our waste we should also contribute to that so for us it's important to uh, make sure that garbage and recycled matter is managed well because we want to be um, following proper environmental sustainable procedures so that we're not creating so much waste we want to try and create less waste if possible meaning that we use less packaging meaning we throw away less food items meaning we keep more item uh, more money in our pockets how do you manage the following types of waste in the workplace the vegetable peelings we would keep to the side for composting waste from raw meat and fish and poultry we would um, essentially put that in the disposal packaging material we would keep for recycling according to if it's metal if it's uh, glass or if it's um, cardboard or um, plastics we would separate them and then store them accordingly into the individual bins food waste from customer plates and eggshells so these could be used for composting we could all store them for composting if we could or put them in the disposable um, bin liners that are food grade and then store them in an area until it is ready for collection by an external company which waste management procedures are in place in your organization so if I'm talking about Equish restaurant whenever we um, collect enough um, rubbish or within the end of business day if it's not full we still dispose of that bin and the contents of that bin liner and we throw it away into the bin room which is separate from our preparation area um, and we essentially wait until a delivery can oh sorry a pickup can be scheduled for that week of that waste usually there is a pre-scheduled date for that specific company so for us it's a Tuesday so we know um, on the Tuesday night they will oh sorry it's a Wednesday morning like early morning so we on the Tuesday night we make sure all of our waste for that week is in those bins and then they get picked up by the um, specified company could be um, you know skip bins australia or could be uh, jj richards there's so many companies so you don't really need to mention the company but yeah they get picked up on the tuesday morning meaning wednesday early morning as we um, package out all our recycling our composting our oils and also our rubbish so at the end of the day if we even though if we don't have a full day's worth of rubbish we'd still dispose of that bin uh, waste we would also if, if our bin um, does get full and it's not the end of the day we would also dispose of the um, the contents of that bin and then line it with a new bin liner that is food grade okay so complete that come back to me when you're ready and we can move on to the next one Maintain a clean environment. 5.3. Identify and report cleaning, sanitizing and maintenance requirements. Identify cleaning, sanitizing and maintenance requirements. Visibly see a uh, need for equipment, surfaces or utensils to be cleaned, sanitized or maintained. Check records. Flaws or uh, malfunctions um, such as a device may require recalibration or repair or required resources are unavailable. Activity 5C. What would you do in the following situations? You notice dirt and grease on knives and spoons that are on the same chopping board as pastries um, that are being prepared for service. First of all, if they're being prepared for service, you need to stop them and then tell, instruct the worker or you to clean the area first and then move on to the next task, which is the pastries. Without cleaning the area, they cannot move on to the next task. Once you've cleaned the knives and spoons and eliminated the dirt and grease, then start the pastries. Um, and whatever has been contaminated already, we would dispose of. 
the temperature probe is not working properly so we would calibrate it using the hot water method or the ice water method but the hot water method is the easiest we would calibrate it um, over uh, the hot water over a minute and then using the zeroing screw we would um, bring it to 100 degrees set it there and then clean it out <coughs> sanitize it and leave it for the next person to use you notice some chips in the glass that are being prepared for service so first of all you need to check the glass if it's um, you know contaminated anything else where it was chipped then dispose of that glass accordingly and make sure that no glass chips are present in the preparation area the motor on the food mixer seems to be working slowly and is not mixing properly so first you want to check the maintenance records if it's been maintained properly if not you want to report it to the manager on site and put a label on top of the item that it's not mixing properly uh, the equipment so the next person might not try and use it and malfunction and hurt themselves you would also <coughs> if possible request to purchase or have a repair done on the item as soon as possible all right so complete those for each of those scenarios and then come back to me and we can move on to the next one 5.4 dispose of or dispose of or report chipped broken or cracked eating drinking or food handling utensils dangerous utensils chipped broken or cracked utensils pose a number of potential hazards they can cause injury to a person using them a chipped glass can cut the person drinking from it and can harbor contaminants and cause future issues to other people what are chipped or broken or cracked drinking food and utensils dangerous well we just said it you know you can um, internally or externally hurt people such as customers staff and um, any others that may be involved it can also cause um, future issues such as um, dangers to other foods that we might serve so complete that come back to me when you're ready and we can move on to the next one 5.5 take measures within scope of responsibility to ensure foods um, ensure food handling areas are free from animals and pests and report incidents of animals or pest infestation so legal requirements not permit live animals in areas where food is handled other than seafood or fish or shellfish only permit assistance animals in areas used by customers take all practicable measures to prevent pests entering the food premises and eradicate and prevent the harborage of pests common animals and pests so we've got cockroaches ants flies moths uh, weevils birds rodents activity 5e what steps can be taken to ensure the food handling areas are free from animals and pests so first of all we um, don't allow any animals or pests in the preparation area secondly we try and minimize any open or closed en um, entrances or windows or anything like that <coughs> and if things like that do happen that we regularly have pest control conducted so that new infestations cannot happen what signs might alert you to the presence of following pests and animals so uh, unknown hairs feces um, marks um, could be dead fe uh, dead pests of old um, yeah um, bite marks things like that on on bite marks on items or um, yeah anything that shouldn't be there and you think is uh, from an animal you need to organize a pest control in your own job role what would you do if suspected presence of animal pests on the premises so if I was a manager I would first of all stop preparation in that area quarantine the area off um, dispose of any foods that have may be contaminated and immediately organize a pest control once the pest control is done sanit clean and sanitize the area thoroughly dispose of any foods that are left or have been 
affected by the sanitation and pest control and we will need to get the area signed off by the pest control people that they have conducted and are sure that there are no more pests in that area and then once we are happy we would open it up for reuse and food preparation. Alright, so once you've done that, come back to me and we can move on to the next one. So 6.1, mark and separate from other foodstuffs any food identified for disposal until disposal is complete. So food disposal, food for disposal may include food um, that is subject to recall, has been returned having previously served to a customer is not safe or suitable, ex uh, such as being expired or showing signs of being spoiled, has not been stored correctly or hasn't been followed uh, the procedures that were set out for it, is reasonably suspected or not being safe or suitable for consumption, or has been contaminated by other external factors. Alright, so 6a, which foods may be necessary to dispose of? So things that have been returned by customers, things that you suspect that have not been um, correctly taken care of and procedures were not followed, um, things that have ex uh, passed the four hour, two hour rule and need to be disposed of, things that look uh, less than normal and the quality is not there and you suspect that it's quote unquote off and um, not good to consume, that might not be smelling bad or looking bad. How might food um, for disposal be dealt with? So first you would accumulate all the foods that you want to dispose of, show that to your manager once they are happy with the amount of food that you're disposing, create a disposal report, get them to sign off on it and then dispose of it as soon as possible with the correct disposal procedure. Um, in your own organization, where do you store food for disposal before it is disposed? So in my organization, such as Equus Restaurant, we've got a separate bin room that is um, way further from our food preparation items, which is like 50 meters away from our food preparation items and food preparation area. So there's not much chance of food contamination from that disposal area. And we also have a... Um, a specific company that collects our disposed items and we have a procedure in place that um, you know it's placed in a sealed off bin in a sealed off room so nobody can get in or out unless it's one of the staff or the collection company. How do you prevent contamination of foods that will be consumed? So we don't leave items open uh, we don't have raw meats on top of cooked meats we don't have people wearing loose jewellery or we don't have people having uncovered body hair. We try and have everybody wear proper protective equipment on their bodies. We try and not work around pets or vermin. Try not to have any windows or doors open. We try and um, avoid any people coming in that should not be in the food preparation area uh, yeah and there's many other factors just think about some of the things how you can do we try and use single use um, utensils or one utensil for each item that we do use for the specific buffet so that it's not mixed in with other items Okay. so once you complete that come back and we can move on to the last portion of this so feel free to pause the video, complete those questions and come back. So 6.2, dispose of food promptly to avoid cross-contamination. This may involve scraping leftover food from plates, etc. into appropriate garbage receptacles as it enters the kitchen, taking out garbage at regular intervals to appropriate disposal points, example, outside dumpster. Recycling waste that is suitable for recycling using food disposal systems if installed. Alright, so we've got the last um, question. So what may be involved in disposing food promptly? So when we're disposing food, we're scraping all the equip um, equipment or um, 
plates or utensils that come back thoroughly so all the items that we need to dispose of are in the bin or the desired receptacle and then when we're ready to dispose of it we tightly seal up our bin liner and then dispose it in the correct bin room and wait for a collection to occur so we're not um, you know contaminating any of our current foods and we don't have the disposal area near any food preparation area so we can eliminate any cross contamination between that happening okay so as this is the last activity complete that and uh, hand in your learner workbooks to your trainers and they will do the needful on those we also have the assessments that need to be conducted so we've got the multiple choice which is online which you can do then we've got the knowledge question um, skills and performance which will be done accordingly to your trainers um, requirements that they set out for you and when they're ready uh, if you have any questions or any feedback uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me my email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au uh, if you see me anywhere don't be afraid to ask me any questions um, yeah so if you have anything that you need to say or ask uh, don't be afraid to do so hand in your learner workbooks once you're done and if you're confused anywhere if you need to revisit anything you're more than welcome to replay the video at any time um, it should be listed in your um, learning resources in your student portal so you're more than free to access this at any time okay so finish that and I will catch you on the next one